Were you born into an artistic family? Um, neither of my parents are um, artists or, or in any way creative for their profession, but um, they've always been very interested in art, and as a child I was always taken to museums, art galleries and theatre. And actually my, um, my dad was very interested in design, he was an interior designer, but um, he, it, so we always had sort of quite an eclectic mix of furniture and uh, I remember, I used to love going to Habitat. That was... <laughs> With the age of five. <laughs> well I did, I yes. loved it. Um, I liked the clean lines and all of that, so yeah. Okay. Um, you've been quoted as saying that you love theatre and that you loved it from a very, very early age. So what do you think switched you on? What, what created that love of theatre? Well, um, ever since I can remember, I always used to make model theatres from very, very, I mean, like, really ever since I can remember. So I was the kid that even with Lego, I would make, I might make a spaceship, but I would also make model theatres. Um, <clears throat> when I went to dance class, um, it, it, quite early on, I was chosen to be part of Northern Ballet Theatre's production of Nutcracker. Um, and just being, seeing at that early age that grown-ups worked in theatre, that really excited me to know that I could possibly be involved with theatre for the rest of my life. So, I have to admit, it wasn't necessarily dance that brought me in, it was more being involved in the theatre. Uh, your sign is Aries. That's right. Uh, uh, your element is fire, uh, your life pursuit is the thrill of the moment, and you're regarded in astrology as adventurous, active, outgoing, trusting, and always able to bounce back. Does that ring true to you? <laughs> <laughs> you can be quite honest I, with it, it, do, it does. <laughs> it does. And I, I think you know, I'm not, I don't really look at star signs, so I don't really know I didn't know that. Is that really the case? Uh, I, I haven't um, made it up, I promise you. That's <laughs> Okay, then yes. Yes! I never <laughs> can. Good. Okay. You also, I read in an interview, uh, or an article about you, you had long, lean legs. I still do, though. From, uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> what made you want to dance? Was it those legs? Um, and what made you start lessons? The reason I went to ballet class was because my best friend from across the road got taken, little girl, age of three, she got taken to ballet class, so I had no one to play with in the evening, so I said, can't I go where she goes? Simple as that. All right. She um, didn't continue her dancing because she couldn't skip. <laughs> I could. She's now a lawyer in London, probably earning a lot more than I am. <laughs> but at least I can skip. Uh, and I, that's why I went to class, uh, ballet class originally. But um, I, I love the music as well. I remember that very clearly, that the, the, um, the idea of working with a musician in the room, now I look at it, it's a musician, but for, at the time it was just wonderful to have live music, um, to be dancing. Yeah, I, I, as I say, though, it wasn't until I really started working in a theatre at a very young age that I really got the fire in my belly. Were you the only boy in your class at that yeah. time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the way. were you, did you have a problem at school? Were you bullied because you went to dance? Um, yes, you know, it was tough at primary school. Um, and I think, I hope it's not so bad now because dance is so much more accepted. It's so much part of our culture now. It's on TV and it's, it, it's in the popular consciousness, I think, now. I'm grateful for, actually, I'm grateful for Northern Ballet for existing. They were only 10 years old at the time, and I was six. So <laughs> maybe we grew up together. But um, having, being able to turn around to those people at my primary school and say, well, I'm on stage, I'm doing something. That, that gave me real uh, strength and confidence. Tell us about the teachers at that early stage, which is so, so important. Yeah, I, 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 I'll happily tell you about uh, my teachers <coughs> at that time. I did do the Royal Academy grades at that time. I was with Northern Ballet School. There was a marvellous teacher there called Marcia Rhodes, um, who 
oh, I just, she's, I, I just remembered all my classes with her. Uh, but Miss Chadwick was at the piano, uh, Marcia Rhodes teaching, and together they were just a fabulous combination. They would, um, not only were the exercises interesting and, and the teaching was very good, it was the creativity that they used as well. I remember particularly this exercise where we had to stand at the back of the room and you guys probably have done this a hundred times, but walking quietly to the front so as not to disturb the teacher and then she turns around and you know you have to be still as a statue. But I just remember, I just would get so excited when she would say everyone to the back of the room. Because, and and the set, it was a real excitement that I, I knew I could be creative, I could, you know, that was a moment for, for me to, to do something different. Um, but Marcia was a wonderful teacher. So, so, I mean, I know it's pure speculation, sort of hypothetical now, but, but if she hadn't created that sort of real inspiration in you, do you think your career might have gone in a different direction? Quite possibly. But that sort of seminal, that uh, important? It, it probably wasn't during my, um, my sort of teens and my twenties, but when I look back on it, I, I have to say it must have had a massive influence. And not only in the, in the studio, but also her support while I was performing on stage. I remember her saying to me, this is really special, because if that happens in your life very early on, then that's normal to a child. Why, why wouldn't you be on stage? I thought all kids did that at six. <laughs> but she, Marcia was able to, you know, tell me how amazing that was. And so you then went on to um, Northern Ballet School. Um, and were you happy there? Was that a uh, to the Royal Ballet School? Uh, to the Royal Ballet School. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes, I was. It took it took me a while to settle in. Right. Um, Big culture shock. I had an accent. So Thank when you. Did, you, did you leave that at the door? After six weeks, I did. Yeah. I went home after my first half did my first half term holiday and that girl that I'd gone to dancing school with when I got home she went what are you talking about that for? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah I'd left my accent. Was that, was that a conscious decision of yeah. yours or did it just? No I, I, I very consciously changed the way I spoke. Um, in those days it regional accents weren't celebrated as they are now rightfully so um, and I sounded different, so I, I, kids don't want to be different, they want to be the same, so, so I've got a neutral accent. I, I think actually I, I missed out uh, something which I thought was um, amusing and interesting. Uh, I think that one of the first roles you, we were cast in, I guess this is before the Royal Ballet School, was uh, as Trouble, uh, right. Northern Ballet and Man Butterfly. Uh, I'll leave aside the appropriateness of the casting uh, for a moment, because yes. I'm sure you probably were trouble. Um, but but just just tell us, because that was your really your first professional engagement. Yeah, interestingly, um, my first professional engagement. I was six years old, and this was a ballet um, choreographed by a choreographer called Jonathan, Jonathan Thorpe. Um, it was a new work to the Puccini score, and I played the little boy. Um, and it was my very first taste of theatre. I was working with a principal dancer called, well, her, her English name was Jenny, her Chinese name was Sui Kang Ching. Um, beautiful dancer. Um, there's a very powerful scene at the end of Madame Butterfly, of course, when uh, the, the central character commits suicide. And in this production, the little boy, my character, was placed on a, a dining table and the, she lowered the American flag and wrapped it round the boy and blindfolded him and then did the deed. So it was quite a dramatic moment. Anyway, one performance, she wrapped the flag around me and she came up and she was all over my face. And I, I was six, very much. She's all over my face. And I'm just sitting there and uh, she's saying something to her. I couldn't understand a word she was saying. And then she kept really close and she was like, close your eyes. And there was no blindfold. And so I sat and just thought, oh, so I closed my eyes. And I knew 
not to open them again until I heard the curtain hit the stage, the chains in the stage, uh, uh, chains in the curtain. So I like to think I was very professional. <laughs> from day one. From day one. So yes. And interestingly, uh, both that one and my second appearance with Northern Ballet was also a newly created work called Miss Carter Pink by Geoffrey Corley. And again, I thought that was normal, that when you were in a ballet, it was created on you. I didn't realise till I did things like Nutcrackers and Swan Lakes that they'd been done hundreds of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, moving on now, we're back, back to the Royal Ballet School. Uh, you were there aged 11. Was it sort of much the same in terms of training as what had gone before, or was this just a whole new world? It was a whole new world. At that time, the, the culture of the school was a um, boot camp. So, strip you back to basics and start again. So my first few lessons at the school, I, d I can't remember dancing for the first week. We practiced saying our names. <laughs> um, one by one, my name is Christopher Hampson and I'm from Manchester. And at the time I said it with a thick Mancunian accent and we just went round and round until we sounded the same. Okay. And then we started dancing, was just in first position, I remember, for weeks. I, I, I was very, very, very homesick that, that first term, I really was. Um, I missed my teacher. I missed my parents. Of course I missed my parents, but I knew I wanted to go to the Royal Ballet School, so I knew that was part of the bargain. But I missed Marcia very, very much. Um, I, I think that's what made me homesick, now I've come to think of it. It was, her. was the lessons. I wasn't dancing. So, um, your abiding memory of your time at the Royal Valley School? Um, look, you know, that was a term. I was there for eight years, years, and it was, a, it was a wonderful experience, and I had excellent teachers there. Um, there was a teacher there called Anatoly Grigoriev, who was a, a very strong and quite a strong taskmaster. Um, but I, I really enjoyed his teaching. Um, he just didn't accept anything less than excellent. Um, and he even, we were his first year as students, uh, as, as, student, as his teacher. Uh, he, he came in from Russia, no English, so we learned Russian. Raz, dva, tri, štyr, pět, šest, sedm, osm, devět, deset. I love that. That was Anatoly all over. I don't know English, so you are all going to learn Russian. So I still know bits and parts of the body in Russian and all that. But I, he was a very good teacher. So the teaching of the regime generally was very, very much tougher yes. than what you had experienced before. Yes. Um, is that probably still the same nowadays, or do you think things have changed? And, and whether or not it's the same, did that prepare you for the profession better? Um, no, I think um, teaching styles have changed, um, and importantly they needed to, because dancers today are having to cover a great many more dance styles and vocabularies than perhaps my generation. I guess I was trained really um, it, it just in a very classical manner. Um, we rarely did contemporary, um, which now is a given. When I audition dancers now, I give them repertoire that, you know, I, I, oh, I want to see something classical, and I give them some repertoire that we're performing currently. So that wouldn't have happened in, in my day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, is there an, an, an understanding as you're working your way through the Royal Valley School that you that the sort of ultimate goal is to go into the company? Is that very much? It certainly was when I was there. Um, it was the Royal Ballet or nothing. Okay. So you come to the point where you're auditioning at the end of your time at the school and you don't get in. Mm -hmm. Was that tough? Was that yeah, and that's what happened to me. Um, I was in my second to last year and told that um, some of my year were taken in to the Royal Ballet at that time. Um, we were a particularly strong year of 
boys um, and most of them went into the company and they said to me um, just to complete one more year to strengthen and then you'll come to the company and I didn't, they didn't have any contracts. Um, and yeah, I, it was absolutely heartbreaking. Um, yeah. How did you deal with that? And was there anyone there to help you through that or were you just on your own? Um, I felt like I was on my own, but um, Katie Wade was um, at the school at the time. And I remember very clearly she took me into her office and picked up the phone and said, I'm arranging that you go to, firstly, to Scottish Ballet, ironically, um, and to English National Ballet. So I came up to Glasgow, I auditioned for Kenny Burke, um, who was running SB2 at the time. Um, and he offered me a job. And I said, well, next week I'm off to EMB to audition in Bristol. And he said, ah, you're good to EMB. <laughs> <laughs> I did. But I, I went down to um, Bristol, I think, the following weekend or something. It was midweek, actually, I remember. Um, and I, I auditioned for EMB. And uh, the assistant director at the time was Lynn Wallace. Good Lord, who's she? That's funny. <laughs> And remember Lynn and Ivan Naj, um, who was the director, uh, took me to the, into the company <coughs> office and into the dressing room and said, well, we'd like to offer you a contract and can you start today? We're doing Cinderella. <laughs> it should have given me a clue as to sort of company that EMB is, which is, <laughs> you know, have you got two legs and you can stand up, you're on. <laughs> so, um, I, I actually said no. I said, I'd love to join, but I want to graduate. And I insisted on uh, graduating from the Royal Valley School. So it was, it, Katie was so quick to, to turn it around. She was really proactive. So just for a moment, pause, because I'm sure that, that many teachers uh, see their students fail at auditions sometimes. So what's the advice that you think that failure should, that person failure should be given? What's the best I think the best advice I can give is to make sure that any student or pupil has a sense of perspective. What was so wrong in the time I was at the school was the Royal Ballet was held in front of your face all the time. And, you know, we all know it's a much, much bigger... That is an excellent company, the Royal Ballet. It is one of the world's leading companies. But so are many, many others across the globe. And so I guess a sense of perspective is really important. It's not the only yeah. thing on the beach. And also, my grandmother from Scotland, Hazel Twelve, she used to say, what's for you won't get past you. So I think that's true. And those first auditions, uh, to get into a company, um, were they tough auditions? What, what were you being asked to do? Um, do you know they weren't actually? They, it was just a ballet class. Okay. Um, I think having been at the Royal Ballet School, perhaps as a student, you're a little bit known within the dance community in the UK. <laughs> so if you're not going to the Royal Ballet, people kind of hear about that. So. You know, people start sniffing around and going, maybe he might want to go here or here. So now you're embarking on your professional career uh, as a dancer. Um, I've, I've also read that you, you've said that you loved to dance by machine. Yes. So just tell us a little about why you particularly love to dance by I love dancing Balanchine because it's, um, you have to be a good classical ballet dancer to dance Balanchine and and that's what I loved. That was my training, was in very strong classical dance. But I loved that it suited my body. I was a bit Bambi on ice when I was um, in my early 20s. I grew very tall, very late. So it was quite weak. Um, but the Balanchine rep suited me. The, 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 the length of limb and, and, and extending lines slightly beyond uh, classical shapes um, suited my body. Further than others could. Yeah. And square dance, was that the first? <laughs> yeah, square okay. dance was um, my first principal role actually. Um, I danced it with a dancer called Hope Muir, who is now the rehearsal director of Scottish Ballet, shows what a small world it is. Um, 
but I love that ballet and it, it appealed to me because also Balanchine was such a musical choreographer. Um, I also played the piano and I, I love that he, he treated music so adeptly. He, like a composer, the way he constructs ballets is, I can see it like <coughs> a composer. He uses themes. Um, he retrogrades things, he, he, you know, pauses for effect, it's, yeah, very, very good architect. And um, e &B is a, a touring company, um, so, so you were on the road a lot. Mm. Um, is, is that much harder work than being part of a company which doesn't tour, or is it just different work? Just different challenges. Um, I think being in a touring company, you don't get as much preparation to be on stage so the rehearsal time technical time with the sets the scenery is a lot harder um, with the challenge with a, a repertory company that's got a theater is um, not as many performances so you don't get as much stage time i was finding with english national ballet that i was performing more roles and bigger roles much faster than my contemporaries that went perhaps to the main company for ballet um, Touring suited me too because I get to travel, and as you know, I love traveling. So um, that was nice. I, I toured with Northern Ballet as a child. Um, I went away to boarding school. I joined EMB, a touring company. I, I don't settle now for very long. <laughs> um, and do you think that, that being a touring company, that, does that create a much more sort of family feel about the company, do you think? Is it, is I it think so, yeah, much much tighter knit um, and very supportive, uh, you know, dancer to dancer is, is very supportive. Um, lots of hijinks, of course, on tour, which is great fun. Um, you probably have a fund of stories. Oh, none I could tell then. <laughs> <laughs> Some I probably could, but... I think there's, um, I think the friends you make in a touring company are normally pretty much friends for life. life. Yeah. Um, now, you're, you're dancing professionally, but there's a sort of change beginning to happen on the horizon uh, because you decide at some point you're not going to be a dancer, you're going to be a choreographer. So just tell us a little bit about how that begin, began to emerge in your mind? Well, this, uh, the choreography had been brewing a bit earlier. I'd started choreographing at 16 at the Royal Ballet School. Um, there's a competition there called the Ursula Morton competition, um, which is quite prestigious, actually. I mean, most of the big choreographers have won it. Um, and I'd done a, a, a short variation, because I had to, as part of the uh, schooling. Um, and it was Norman Morris and David Drew, the choreographic tutors at the time, that said, well, you should put it in the Ursula Morton. And I, now I look back, I was just must have been so precocious. I said, well, you can if you want. I mean, this to a former director of the Royal Ballet. I said, you can put it in if you want, but I don't. Not really fussed either way. And it won third prize. And that I really, I couldn't believe anything I'd made was worth watching. So I did another one, that one second, and then the next one first. Um, so after leaving the school and joining the company I continued to choreograph. So when I began to choreograph more and more for English National Ballet, um, uh, Derek Dean was my director, he gave me a commission with the company. Um, and after that commission I found it very hard to get back into the studio as a dancer. I was getting a buzz from choreography that I'd originally got all those years ago from dancing. Okay. And just be before we move on, um, you, you've slightly skated over that piece that won you the Ursula Morton Prize. Um, but, but I think there's a, a nice story yeah, about well, it. Yeah, well, actually, the, the, importantly, very importantly, the um, judge was Kenneth McMillan. And Kenneth, if I can just before I mention this story about Kenneth, um, he'd actually come into my life the, a couple of years before. Um, a prize had been won at White Lodge by a fellow choreographer called Christopher Wielden, who was in my year. 
and I'd composed the music to a ballet of his and played it. Piano. Chris's piece won the prize. And Kenneth extended the choreographic prize to me as I'd composed the music. And the prize was to go with him and Deborah to see five different pieces of theatre, opera, ballet, concert, uh, drama, and something else. Um, so that had been a, a really wonderful experience. And again, it was Kenneth trying to show us that there was more to life than just the raw ballet. And that was very much who he was. Um, and the ballet he took us to see was London Festival Ballet at the time, interestingly. When I won the Ursula Morton competition, he gave feedback after this uh, prize. And um, he asked me about the music. I'd created the work to two songs by Kurt Weill, um, one called Nana's Lead and the other one called Das ist die sexuelle Hörigkeit. Um, and he'd said to me, do you know what those songs mean? Because they were sung in German, he to Lempo recording. And I said, oh yes, I've studied the translations. And he smiled wryly and said, oh good, because they're filthy. <laughs> 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 and indeed the piece was a bit filthy. Was filthy. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Well, we won't ask the translation at this, this day. Um, so you're now moving in to, to becoming a a choreographer, you, you have, I think, three commissions from ENB quite, quite quickly. Yeah. Um, Perpetua Mobile, Country Garden, and Concerto Grosso. Mm -hmm. um, talk about your approach to creating pieces. What, from an ignorant person, what comes first? Is it the music? Is it the story? Is it the steps? What does take us through that? Pretty much for me, it's the music. I listen to music constantly um, it, it, in the car, on the iPod all the time. Um, I, I rarely don't see movement when I listen to music. I always see movement. Um, so it normally comes from the score. So all of those three first ballets that you mentioned, they were all score driven, I would say. Um, I begin to, when I listen to music, I begin mostly to see patterns and shapes. Um, I would describe it more like um, a, a map. I start to see contours and roads and valleys, and I see the lay of the land, if you like. So it's three dimensional? Yeah, oh, most definitely, yes. yeah. Come on, wouldn't it be? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Sounds silly, doesn't it? But it is. I see, and I, I you know, stare off into the middle distance and see it form. And when I come to go to the studio, I have no steps normally, just, it's so hard to explain. I just see it. Um, and when I come to the studio and I, I work with the dancers and I finish the piece and I look back and it's normally very, very far away from what I had in my head. So you're storing up in your mind different pieces. Mm. Um, different music, different steps, different ideas. Um, and then, when, when do you sort of decide what you're gonna pull out of the, the store cover? It's, it's when the right commission comes along. Okay. So it depends on the company, um, the programming, the particular dancer. Um, one, for instance, is um, English National Ballet commissioned a work from me, and they particularly wanted a big tutu ballet, is what Derek said. And I loved working with a dancer called Daria Klementova. Um, and I, at the time, I'd been listening to Poulenc's Double Piano Concerto. And I was with Daria in Prague. And I decided there that that's, the, that's what I was going to do. Um, it was between that and the um, Prokofiev Fifth Piano Concerto, which I will do eventually. That was enough. It was just to show you that those two pieces were in the competition in my head. Um, but because I love Daria so much working with her, she's so funny. We have such a laugh in the studio, and we're incredibly <coughs> blunt with each other frighteningly blunt. I mean, I think people would find it rude if they just walked in and heard the way we speak to each other. Very quick-witted she is, and I can be. And Poulenc is. His music is wry, it's slick, it's humorous. He, he bashes motifs around like they're nothing. 
And that's how we work together. So Poulang, it had to be for her and for EMV. So that just shows you a little snapshot of. And uh, is there a tussle ever between abstract or narrative pieces? I mean, do you love doing creating both? Or I used to um, love narrative work. So the very first ballet I did, that Kurt Weill piece, I think one of the reasons it won is it was incredibly narrative. It was about three ladies of the night, and I told a story. And, and they weren't just three random women. That Each of the women had their own character, and I think perhaps that's what stood it apart from perhaps other works around at that time. When I started choreographing professionally for English National Ballet, Derek said to me, steps is what he said, very helpful. He said, steps, Hampson, I need to see steps. And he was right, I was beginning to just create tableaus really, and I wasn't linking it with words, if you like, any sort of text. So those first few works were important just to get a vocabulary together. And I spent, I would say, about five to eight years doing that. And then I started to drift back to narrative because I felt I had the tools to be able to say more with narrative work. So your first uh, full-length piece was A Christmas Carol, I think. Yes, that's right. Um, and it was well received. On the whole. Okay, we'd <laughs> um, just be grateful for, for small mercies. Yeah. Um, but it was a different story with Nutcracker, I think. Um, and that was for English National Ballet. Yeah. Um, critics were not kind. That's being kind. <laughs> they, were ri they were quite savage. Um, and it was a very, a very difficult time for me. Um, Nutcracker, just for context for those that perhaps aren't from the UK, for English National Ballet, Nutcracker is their cash cow. That, is, that company was built on Nutcracker. It's the company that brought Nutcracker to the UK. Balanchine took it to America, and he's to blame for all the American companies doing it ad nauseum over Christmas. And it was Mark of Dolan that we have to blame for bringing Nutcracker to England. They were the first to produce a full Nutcracker. So it's an incredibly important work. Um, the commission was to do a new Nutcracker with um, Gerald Scarf, who was the political cartoonist, is the political cartoonist for the Times, and he was also the artistic director for the um, artwork for Pink Floyd's The Wall. So quite a, a crazy uh, combination but a good one. Um, and I collaborated closely with Gerald. I was, I believe, 28. Um, that's quite young to be doing a full length. That's such a high profile work. Um, and it went to the stage quite undercooked. Um, if I can be blunt, EMB, um, they bust the critics down to Bristol on opening night and bust them back. So basically they put 20 critics in a bus for two and a half hours, made them watch a show that wasn't ready and then bust them back to London. Not, not, not a, a great, great idea. Not <laughs> we, we weren't ready. Um, the set was arriving. We opened uh, on a Friday, if I'm right. We were supposed to tech Tuesday, Wednesday, we opened on Thursday matinee, that's what it was. And on Tuesday night, act one set wasn't, just wasn't there. It physically wasn't there, it was on a truck, on the motorway. Um, when behind the bus with the critics. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Wednesday it arrived. I remember on Wednesday, um, I spoke to the company and said, you know, I really need your concentration and patience. Um, and I spoke to them about that we were going to do Act 2 first and how important it was to get that right, then we'd look at Act 1. Um, and I took myself to the back of the circle and I cried. And it was really, really tough. Um, but I learnt that the company needed someone that was calm, and I had to be that person. So, do you read reviews now? Do you read the critics? No. 
Not at all. Never? No, never. Um, it took me about two years to like that production. I hated it with a passion. Um, and it was my partner, Michelle, who I've been with for 14 years. Um, he really, it gave me a sense of perspective. Um, and it was him really that it made me sort of go back to the Colosseum year on year and sit with 2,000 people who laughed and cheered at the end of this show. And he kept saying, what, why are you listening to four people when, you know, in one week, 10,000 people had gone, well, I quite enjoyed that. I've spent 40 odd quid on it and it was all right for my kids. So, yeah, I, I, and that's not to um, say that critics don't have a, a job. They have a very important job and artists and critics have well, coexisted since classical times. Um, but now I understand that critics are outward facing mm -hmm. and I know that through talking with other choreographers and other creators, I don't think there's ever been a critic in history who has ever made a creator change what they do. They might change audience opinions, but not, yes. but not, not, not the within creator. the profession. So your, your career now as a choreographer is beginning really to, to take off, but I want to just step, step one side at the moment because um, there's a sort of underlying thread that I think has been with you throughout your, your life and that's the RAD. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I'd just love to hear, I'm sure we all would, a little bit about the part that the RAD, which I sort of sense has played a quiet but important part in your life. Is, is that over-egging it. It's not at all, and, and well you know, you know that the RAD was there right at the beginning of my um, relationship with dance. Um, and as you've heard, you know, Lynn was very important in my career development. And I hasten to add choreographically, she was very important. She started choreographic workshops at EMB when I was there. Um, so, when she became the director of the Royal Academy of Dance, it was natural that um, I, I suddenly became more aware of, of what the Royal Academy was doing. Um, the reinvention, if I can call it that, of the Gene um, was vitally needed. And I'm glad that I was around at that time when that seemed to be happening. Uh, and I, I like to think maybe there's some sort of influence I've had in, in my part with the Gene, whether that's through coaching or choreographing, um, that, and, and the wraparound events as well that are really important, that, that means that it can go back into the Royal Academy through teaching, through the candidates, through students. Yeah, that it's a, quite a nice full circle. Yeah, I, I would say that, that you have your influence has been very, very important on, on the journey. Um, competitions generally, do you think they're a good thing? I think they have a place. Mm -hmm. I think if they're the right competition, they're a good thing. I think there's many competitions that aren't the right sort of competition. Um, as, as we know, the Gene is known as a friendly competition. Um, seeing those semi-finalists when, when the curtain comes down um, at the semi-finals, what you don't get to see is all the hugging and kissing and it's lovely. That support for the finalists from the other candidates is remarkable um, and it's not at every competition. No, no. Um, so moving on now, last year uh, you took up your post as director of Scottish Ballet. Um, so now you're God. Really. Um, <laughs> how does it feel to be um, It was fantastic. I love my job. I really love my job. Um, it's a massive responsibility. Um, I do, and I look at it, but it, it, it is a responsibility. I'm a guardian, really, as I see it, for the national company here um, and I think that all of the 
the, the jobs along the way I've done, whether that's choreographing, teaching, coaching, um, putting out fires in companies, um, all of those things have led to this one position. Um, so it feels very natural. Um, and it, yeah, it's really enjoyable. Even the, you know, the bumpy bits, the, you know, the sense of, well, sense of achievement when you find your way through those difficult times. Um, and when, when you see a company pull together and, and, you know, in the face of adversity, do an amazing job, it's really fulfilling. I know that I'm working with um, incredibly talented artists um, and with that, I know comes a fragility. Um, I'm working with people that are young. Um, it, it, it is a young profession. I, I, I'm keenly aware that these years that they have a performing career um, will define how they progress in the rest of their life, whether that's within the profession or, or going beyond in, into other careers. Um, so I. I take that quite seriously and I say to my dancers that I have more respect for them if I see that they're doing work beyond dance, whether that's training to be teachers or being at university, um, you know, correspondence learning. I, but that, in my opinion, enhances their performing, performance career, so I'm very adamant about that. And I, I've, I've heard you talk about enjoying working with curious dancers. What, what what do you mean by curious? Um, I'm often asked, asked what sort of dancer I like, and I think most people are wanting to know a body type or a, a technique or, a, you know, whatever that is. It, I like curious dancers because I like a dancer that questions what they're doing, why they're doing it, what are the reasons behind what they're being asked to do. At this stage in the game, it, with a, with a ballet company, the sorts of dancers I'm working with are talented. They do have a good technique, they've been trained, they're in shape, they're at the peak physical condition. So it's not about body type or technique for me, it's, it's what's going on in here. Um, you created a stir very early on when you came to Scottish Ballet um, by getting Matthew Bourne to agree to let you stage Highland Fling. And I think I'm right in saying, correct me if I'm wrong, it was the first time a piece by Bourne has been performed by classical company. That's right. Tell us about that. Why did you do it? Um, I think Matthew Bourne has done an amazing job um, in breaking down barriers in dance and theatre, actually. He's, he's really Done, he's created an audience that just wasn't there before Matthew Bourne existed. He's, he's brought people to dance that would never have, I don't think, come to see the Royal Ballet or English National Ballet or Scottish Ballet. I, mean, I think that's terrific to hear, but, but very often within the sort of professional classical world, mm -hmm. you hear him being really denigrated. Mm -hmm. but, but that's obviously not a view that you, no. you have. No. E even in terms of, of the dance he's creating, not just the fact that he's creating something very popular, but, but what he's creating you think has a place and, and... And very much so. His language has a place. And I would level very... And I'd say if he was in the room, I think Matthew's a classicist, deep down. Um, the way he constructs choreography is in a classical manner. His language might not be, but his language is quite a different... Uh, well, it's his own. But the construction of his works is quite classical. Um, the way he tells a story um, relies on very clear classical lines in storytelling. Um, and the reason I brought him to Scottish Ballet was because I think that as probably the nation's most well-known choreographer, I couldn't believe that not one of our national companies had his work in their repertoire. Um, so, even before I went for the interview for this job, um, I went to see Matthew and spoke to him about my desire to bring a work of his to a national company if I was, say, going to go for a job, <laughs> like artistic director. 
Um, and he, yeah, he, he, he just said yes. So, to, I, I was lucky enough to interview him uh, earlier this, this year, and, uh, and we talked about um, Highland Fling uh, there, and he was really interesting about it, but tell us from your perspective and your dancer's perspective, I mean, how, how was that? Was that a meeting of minds when he was in the studio with them? Um, was it tense to start with? What, what, what was it like? Well, I brought Matthew in also because I know that he works in a very particular way with dancers. He expects dancers to really invest themselves in the character. There's a lot of um, work that they have to do to build their characters, and that's not, not normally the case in dance. <coughs> Excuse me. So I, I really wanted my dancers to experience that. Um, I think, I, and I hope I'm right in saying that Matthew, I assured Matthew that we would be wanting to work in the way he wanted to work, and he wouldn't have to fit in with any preconceived way of being in the studio. I think he was probably, I think he, he believed me, but I think he was very nervous that that wouldn't be the case. Um, normally Matthew handpicks his dancers after a lengthy audition process, and those dancers that are lucky enough to work with him have really been invested in by him and his team. I was presenting him with, I guess, a fait accompli, you know, a group of dancers that he hadn't chosen. I think that was a new experience for him. A terribly leading and general question. Are you optimistic about the future of classical ballet? Is yes. there such a thing still? Yes. And will there be in 20 years? Now? Yeah, absolutely. It's in a really healthy place. I think now that um, the barriers are down between contemporary dance and classical <coughs> ballet, I, I tend to say dance is dance is dance, really. I don't really see that um, classical ballet needs to be defined and contemporary dance needs to define it. I think movement and uh, celebration of the human form is what we're all about. It's what any classicist is about in terms of dance. So I think it's rosy, really. I don't think we could end on a better note than that. Christopher <laughs> Hampson, thank you very much.